So hey everyone, uh, okay I'm loud. <laughs> so hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming here today to, to see the talk. Um, thank you for the introduction. So my name is Florin and that's my twi uh, Twitter handle and today we'll talk about Go modules. So a few things that I want to, to cover in this talk and this is depending on the time. Uh, I would like to, to have like a brief history of the package management in Go and see um, like where we were like a few years ago and where we are today, uh, we will cover the Go modules and explain them and see how they work. Uh, for that, we'll have a demo. And then I'll give you some resources to go uh, home and then, you know, have a look on more documentation about modules. So a brief history on that. Uh, first, there was Go get right and with go get we did not really have any let's say uh, clear versioning we did not have many things that you'd expect from a programming language package manager to have go get was very simple very straightforward to use and it did one thing really well you said go get this package and that's it it would get it latest version and all and it worked with go path then we had the various community solutions, so we'll, uh, we'll see that as well. We had Go Dev, uh, we had Go modules uh, today. So, as I was saying, Go Get, very simple, very straightforward. It worked with Go Path, and everything was inside Go Path. No different versions for the same uh, project, no different version for the same uh, dependency, everything was on the same version, right? But that posed problems because you could download uh, various source codes at different points in time, which would depend maybe perhaps on a different version, right? On a different commit. So that was not good. Uh, updating the dependency for a project back then meant go get minus u, and everything was updated for that mm, specific project. But again, <laughs> you could break stuff. And finally, you could not really remove unused dependencies from your path, to, like from your Go path to clean it up because it was hard to identify, okay, do I really need this in my current project or is this dependent on another project that, you know, I might use or not. Slowly, uh, the community started having more solutions and there were quite a few solutions. Uh, at some point, I think there were like 14, 15 solutions that were involving some sort of package management in Go. And I remember when we had the Go Slack channel, uh, like people were coming in and like among the first questions that we had, they were like, okay, what should I use to uh, handle dependencies in Go? And then like everybody was recommending their own favorite tool <laughs> to do it. So that was not really good. Um, some of them had different really uh, levels of support as well. So some of them were more maintained, the others were abandoned. That was not uh, a good place to be in. But eventually, most of them were converging towards the same feature level. So yeah, there was no clear winner. And with that happening, well, <laughs> if you know the XKCD on this one, <laughs> it's basically there are 14 different standards. Okay, let's <laughs> let's make one one standard to cover them all. So that was the the state of um, art back then. And then we had GoDep. GoDep was the Go team experimental package management, written mostly by the community. So the Go team said, okay, we need to to have something that comes in and covers everything, and like hopefully people will migrate from all the previous package managers to this one. Um, it was implemented mostly by community, so that was cool. Uh, and yeah, people were slow, uh, started slowly to, to adopt it, making the migration towards Go modules easier. And we'll see that in a second. So Go modules, uh, it's the current way, it's the current approach for uh, making dependencies in Go work. And it's a solution proposed somewhere in February 2018 when Russ announced it and was like, hey, I've been thinking about this system based on the learnings that we had from DEP, from all the other package managers, from other languages, from Rust, and so on. So that was a big announcement. Uh, it changed how we think about dependencies because um, it introduces a new way 
to resolve dependencies. In terms of version, it has an algorithm called MVS, which stands for Minimal Version Selection. So that relies on like a bit of a different algorithm than what was used before. And we'll try and cover that a bit later in the talk. It was uh, optional in 1.11, and you actually had to opt in as a feature. So you had to say, uh, you had to set this environment variable, go 1.1.1 modules, to on, to actually make it work. Uh, default was off. In 1.12, uh, it was turned on as auto, <laughs> so when you were outside of Go path, you would have this uh, Go module feature enabled in certain conditions, as long you as you are outside of Go path. From 1.13, uh, Go 1.13 said, okay, now even if you are in Go path, Go modules will be enabled for you if there is a certain condition meant. And that condition meant that uh, the Go mod file, which we'll cover in a bit, was present. And we supported in Goland in since May 2018, so we had a bit of support for that since a while ago. So the new features of Go modules, and I say new features, although they are a year and a half old now, it's the fact that introduce it introduces two files. And you probably have seen those files starting to show up in repositories. Those are the Go mod file and Go sum. GoMod will be uh, a list of dependencies that your project directly depends on. And you'll, you'll see uh, both the name of the module itself, uh, and I'll show you in the demo. You'll see what it requires as dependencies and their versions. GoSum, on the other hand, lists those, de those dependencies and it uh, gives a cryptographic hash for them so that when the time comes and you're like downloading something or try to verify it, it says, oh, I'm certain that this dependency at this version is exactly the one that you have and that your colleague has. And that's very important because it means that it brings security into your pipeline. It means that you have a way to be certain that nobody goes on the server, changes the version of your dependency in such a way that it gives you the same version, let's say 1.5, but with a tiny hack in it, <laughs> or like with a backdoor. So it, it helps you prevent stuff like that. What happened uh, with the new features of Go modules? It can work outside of Go path. So I was saying earlier that it introduced a new mode where Go, the Go command can now work outside of Go path. It understands that. So you don't have to put all your source code anymore inside a certain Go path which is good and bad, if you ask me. Like, I used to, wor uh, to, to like the, the structure of GoPath, but I understand that people might want to have their own, let's say, projects directory with only the projects they work on and not have the whole, let's say, GitHub structure or other version control system. It also introduced a few environment variables. <laughs> so at first, there was the, uh, sorry, at first there was the Go proxy. Right, uh, and then there was uh, in 113 go some DB, go private, go no proxy, and go no some DB. <laughs> so it's a bit harder if you look at it to be like, okay, there are a few environment variables. Now what? And we'll cover those and see how they work. Basically, what go proxy is is a way to tell the go uh, command, okay, I want you to use this proxy value here and go and fetch my dependencies from that address. GoSumDB, on the other hand, provides a way for your GoSum files to be verify, well, to verify against that uh, server address and say, for this package, at this version, do I have that correct hash? And yeah, that, that works fairly well <laughs> so far. Go private, on the other hand, comes in in 1.13 and says, well, People have private dependencies. So what happens if, for example, I want to retrieve, um, let's say, a private package in GitHub, and I have Go proxy set to, let's say, proxy.golang.org, which is the uh, proxy from the Go team. Well, it's going to give me an error, right? Because it's a private package. It can't be indexed by, by that proxy. So that's where Go private comes in and says, 
in this case, go and fetch it directly. <laughs> Ignore the proxy setting. Go no proxy also helps you not proxy <laughs> to <laughs> to that. So it's a it's a bit harder to explain, but I'll show you exactly what happens in reality. So among <laughs> those features, there are more commands to learn now. So there's go mod init, which is the first command that you'll have uh, to, to interact with if you want to create a module. Go mod init is good to, to run in an empty folder or in an existing folder from one of the supported package managers that you can do the migration from. Ideally, if you used to use uh, go dep, running go mod init in inside the root directory where your uh, package uh, definition, I forgot the name of it, package tamil part, I, I think it was, um, uh, it will basically allow you to transcribe that set of dependencies from, from the tamil format to the uh, go module format. So that's automatic. Go get has been updated as well. So you can still use go get to fetch dependencies, only now that go get allows you to actually specify a version. So if like, let's say before go modules, like before two years ago, go get was not aware of any versioning. It was going to the repository and fetching the latest version, whatever was at head you'd get. Now you can say, okay, go get at this specific version or go get that specific commit, which is pretty cool. There's go mode tidy, which allows you to basically tidy up your dependencies. So whenever you have, let's say, a, a project, you add more libraries, you have things that you're trying out, you do, let's say, you add library, and then you realize, okay, I don't need it anymore. I delete it from the import list, but it will still be in the go mode file because I added that. So what happens is GoMod Tidy looks at ov all over your dependencies and says, okay, you don't need that anymore, you don't need that anymore, I can remove those. It also cleans up a lot of other stuff in the background, but yeah, basically that's the, let's say, uh, useful bit from it. Go list, uh, go list minus M means, okay, list everything that Go list was doing with module support. And all will give you the list of all dependencies. So when, whenever you say go list minus m all, in a project which has go modules enabled, it will give you all the dependencies of your project. So this could be useful if you're building, building tools or in your CI pipeline to perhaps see whatever changed and so on. And then there's go mode vendor. So the vendoring mode uh, is still here. So if you used before the vendor folder to put your uh, dependencies inside it and be sure that you don't depend on the internet to, to have a build pipeline or like work on your machine, uh, that command will help you. And what it will do is basically copy all your dependencies from the go module structure into your vendor folder and guarantee that they are there. So you can still use vendoring approach. Okay, uh, I think now we can do some demo and like show you properly how it works, right? <laughs> okay. So let's go here to a project. And I'm gonna use the terminal from within Goland, but I could do this from any other terminal or editor. Um, what happens here? So I have a new project, right? And as you can see, I or already have like a go mod file, um, oh, sorry. I'm not used to PowerPoint changing my screen. Duplicate. Ah, there you go, much better. Can you see it in the last row? Yes, okay, cool. So, back to presentation mode. Then, uh, I have a go mod file, a go sum file, and our main file right here. So let's have a look at the go mod file. The structure would be something like this. Let me zoom in a bit. So basically, you define a name here. You have module and the name of the module. This could be anything. So for example, we could say this is github.com slash DL sniper awesome project 10, right? And now your project would 
be under the import path of github.com slash dlcypher slash awesomeproject10 because that's where it should reside. But you can name your module however you want. Uh, then you see a directive here called go113. This actually tells the Go compiler the version that you target your module to be compatible with. So for example, if I were to use Go 1.14 uh, as a dependency, I would now receive a warning from the compiler saying, hey, this module actually says, well, uh, I don't know how to work properly or may not work properly with Go 1.13. The author created me for Go 1.14 upgrade. Same goes if you, like, if you use an older version, let's say Go 1.12 here, the, the compiler would actually say, oh, okay, so you want to target the Go 1.12 feature set. And this is now added automatically by the Go uh, mod init command. And you can use something like Go 1.11, for example, to target an older version. I do recommend having this set uh, if you are using Go 1.12, uh, for example, because the newer versions of Go will add it automatically. And what will happen uh, is that at some point, the com like if you do a go build command, it's going to be forcefully added to you. So that means you'll have an extra change that you need to revert. So instead of going through all the motion of <laughs> reverting the file, go build, OK, now I need to revert it again because there's a change, set it to something like Go 1.11 or an appropriate version that you your module needs to have. And then if you go in the main file here, you'll see that, for example, here I'm depending on a certain import path, right? So I have the DL Sniper AII project that I'm depending on. And it shows up as a red path right now because it says, oh, I can't resolve anything here. So this means that there is no information for the comp Go compiler and the ID in this case to actually do anything about that import path. OK, so let's do something about it. One way to specify that you want to depend on something would be to either add it manually here. So let's see if I can type on this. Require github.com, DL sniper, AII. And if I do a save here, you'll see that it, I get an error. Why do I get an error? Because I also need to specify a version. So by default, you can't just say, oh, I'm depending on that version without having a version to, to depend, right? So let's say I'm going to put here latest. So if I save again, I'm going to wait for the gopher to finish. And as you can see, it's running the, well, sorry for the resolution, the go list command. And let's see what the actual command is here. Uh, let me see. Go list minus M, all. So these are all the dependencies that I have now added to, to my project based on, on the fact that I'm pulling that repository, right? And you, see you start to see packages such as Google, uh, well, cloud.google.com uh, slash go, add version. So that's pretty cool. Like I, I know that I'm depending on that certain version. There's also versions that, that you can recognize from a semantic version point of view, which is another change that is introduced with Go modules. Now you can, uh, if you're used to, let's say, the JavaScript ecosystem or PHP, where you, you tag your releases, right? You probably use Semver to do that, so semantic versioning. You can now <laughs> start doing that in Go as well. And more than that, you should actually do it because it's going to be easier uh, down the, the path. For example, whenever Go will not find the semantic version release of that package, like it happens here with the uh, Dimitri GPU MTL package, you'll see this pseudo version added. So that's pretty hard to, to read by us humans, right? Because it's like version 00, zero and then there's like a date in it and there's also a commit hash. That commit hash uh, actually points 
to the, the certain commit that the package was at when it was retrieved. And then there's the uh, date of the last commit, so in or better said, that commit specifically. So it's hard to read. On the other hand, when whenever you have like v1.0.1, much easier to, uh, to understand what you're <laughs> referencing to, right? Uh, this gets translated automatically also, for example, if I don't have a version for the latest. <laughs> so if you remember here, I wrote require at latest, right? So I was like, require latest. But I don't version my package there, right? So in that case, it was, uh, let's convert latest to a version. And that's the version I got. If I were to do something like require github.com uh, gorilla max at v164, sorry, auto completion is in the way, it would actually leave it like that. So it, wi it will not, uh, well, if v164 would actually exist. <laughs> I thought it was released at v165 or 4. Anyway, so you get the idea. Like, this would not be changed. So, moving forward, what can you do? Uh, let's go back here in our file. Uh, this will still be unresolved because, like, the Go compiler has now two steps it listed the dependency, it, so it's there. But then, like, it actually needs to download it somehow. So whenever you your work here, go build, and do you actually see this? So I do a go build right now. And you'll see that there's a download step and an extract step now. So the first part was just listing the dependency itself and making sure it's there. But then there's the downloading part, which needs to happen. It's a bit uh, different from what we are used to because before Go Build was did not need any internet access, right? You were having the dependencies locally, and that's it. Uh, you had them in Go Path. Uh, you were doing Go Get, and they were there. Now you have to also download them somehow, and Go Build can do that. Not only Go Build can do that, but for example, if I were to remove these and download, let's say, or, or depend on, on a library that's not in my cache, uh, then, for example, Go list could download that dependency. Okay, so we are here in the point of like, okay, I can build a project. It's fairly straightforward. And if I go back to my editor, I can see I have some data in my Go some file, right? So if you remember at the beginning when I said that there are two files, right? Go mod and go sum. This is how the go sum file looks like. So it's a big blob of text, if you ask me, which doesn't really make sense for, uh, for us humans to read, right? But go will be able to have a look at the list of all these dependencies here and say, oh, okay, so at some point you worked with uh, Google, mm, well, the cloudgoogle.com slash go library at version 20, 0 026, right? And for that, you retrieved a hash that was this one, the, the first one. Then you worked and upgraded that to a certain ver newer version. So you can also go back in time and, and revert. And when you do that, you'll still have the guarantee that the package you reverted to, the version you reverted to, is the same one you used to work. So no more uh, breaking changes when you go back in time, if you really need to. So that's how the, the, the file works. And um, if you need more details, Filippo is actually here in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and although he's hiding now, uh, he can provide a bit more information on how the, the whole uh, hash works and Okay, so he recommends Katie's talk, which is next, so perfect. Um, I see what you did there. <laughs> 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 so he's like, oh no, I'm deferring. Okay, so moving forward. I, s I mentioned the command called go mod tidy, right? So what does it do? If I say go mod tidy here, 
not only it will tidy up the uh, dependencies that I have, right? But in this case, it did not do anything because there's nothing to tidy up. Uh, let, let's try and say require github.com and bear with me on this one. Rela max latest. So let's let for the latest to happen, right? So latest was v173. I was just a bit wrong on the version. If I say go mode tidy, so I I haven't changed my go mode like my go uh, files, right? If I s run the tidy command, I'll see that it disappeared. So it's not there anymore because I don't use the dependency anymore, right? There's no reference for it in the in the file. So let's say undo, and let's switch back here and say something like uh, max dot max dot I forgot the name handler and the ID should ask me okay which max do you want oh I'm using the beta version sorry <laughs> should mention with that uh, github.com <sighs> gorilla and max and synchronize the packages, and now it's downloaded, so the ID can actually tell me, okay, you have code from there. So let's use this one. I run the go tidy again, the go mod tidy command. Let me bring the terminal up. Mod tidy, and because I'm now using that, the require command is still there. As soon as I go here, and let's say I comment this line, I don't need the import anymore, right? So I can just remove it and run go mod tidy again. And that's it. I, it's not going to be here anymore, right? So go mod tidy in action. I mentioned the other version, the sorry, the other command that needs to be uh, run, which is go mod vendor. So as soon as I run go mode vendor, what will happen is that all the dependencies that I have in the project, and if you give me one second, will be put here. So now I have a list of all the dependencies if I visit the modules.txt file, right? So I can see the direct dependencies for that, like which modules are depending on what, but also the actual code behind them. So for example, this. I know that I'm using the Go uh, Google Golang or package and so on and so forth. Right. And this is the direct dependency that I had. And it copies, if you notice, there are only a couple of directories here that are copied. In this case, it's the AII voice uh, package. If I were to look on um, the internet, at github.com, DL Sniper, AII. So if I were to look at this package, however, I would see there are more files in here. So one thing to keep in mind is that whenever you'll use the go mod vendor command, is that it will actually copy only the depends uh, parts of the dependencies that are needed. It won't copy everything. What will happen, for example, if you depend on a library which uh, contains some C code or some directories that are uh, referenced from C is that it will actually ignore those <laughs> from copying and you might run into issues. Uh, so you have to be careful how you build your uh, dependencies if you use C. And also, uh, there are no tests as far as I remember, uh, and if there hasn't been any changes since then, there are no test files copied either. So all you get is the pure source files and that's it. There are no tests for your vendors anymore. Uh, I know some people were used to run actual tests for the vendor libraries in their CI. That won't be possible for now. Or I don't know if it's going to change in the future. That's something that you need to go and give as a feedback to the Go team. Um, OK. So. That's roughly it. That's how you interact with modules. Uh, I haven't created a project from scratch, but let's say I would do that. Like, how can I do that quickly? Let's say I go here in Show in Explorer, 
right? And let's leave the ID for, for, for now. Let's say I create a new file uh, or folder in this case. Uh, let's say go lab Italy. Okay, so this is a blank new one, right? And if I say CMD, I can just jump in go land projects and then go lab it. Bah, it doesn't want me. Go lab projects, go lab Italy. Okay, so go mod in it. And now I have to actually read what it says there. You can't init a module without giving it a name. And you should probably also give it a version. Maybe you want a version for it or not. But the module cannot exist without a name. And if you remember what I've done in the beginning, one of the things that I've done here was, OK, I have a name for my module. So let's give that a name. And let's call it, I don't know, github.com, little sniper. And that's it. So if I look here on my disk now, I see that there is a mod file. And contrary to what Windows wants me to believe, it's not a media file, it's a text file. <laughs> okay. So this is how it looks like. It's an empty file. And we're back from scratch. There's no, uh, when you initialize a new module, there's no mm, some file, because there, it, there are no external dependencies. And the last thing that I want to touch before I <laughs> go back to the presentation and eventually to, to questions, because I'm sure there will be a few, um, I mentioned something about all those environment variables. So for example, one thing that I haven't shown you is the go env, um, go no, uh, sorry, go pre private. So this one was empty, but you can now set that with this go and w github.com slash let's say DL sniper demo or just DL sniper. And then what will happen is that um, everything that's under, um, sorry, forgot the key name, go private. So whenever you run this command, um, you will be able to set the go private environment variable. How it works is that uh, it won't set it in your operating system environment files or the places where the operating system works. There is a new environment file read by the go command. But when you do, again, go env, let me clear this, go private, you'll be able to get the command back. So your tooling will be able to read that. And in this case, uh, your editor should be able to, to understand it. Or if, for example, you're using uh, any custom tooling that you've built to identify that those repositories at github.com are private. github.com slash DL sniper. Other repositories will be public. There's also a few proxies that I mentioned. And those proxies will be uh, here. So let me jump back to my browser and show you a few of them. So these are included in the resources list, but the first one that I can show you is the Go proxy from Go proxy organization on GitHub. Very uh, clear and straightforward name. And this allows you to basically write a Go proxy. I'm going to skip through, through all of it. But allows you to write very, uh, very quickly a Go proxy, and it supports caching on disk, it supports caching on a, a bunch of others, <laughs> and it's updated to support Go 1.13. Uh, and the way to write the Go uh, proxy on your own is as simple as that, which is fairly cool, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> that, that's it. Th you don't need more. Then there's the um, JFrog implementation of Go Center, which allows you to search for modules. So for example, if I go here and I type Cobra, let's say. Here I see SPF 13 Cobra, which probably is a package you may or may not have heard of. Very popular one. 
but you can see that it shows you the readme file, you can see the mod file itself, you can see the dependencies it has, uh, the versions that are present, and even if, if you go here, you can see the metrics. So my screen is not wide enough, but you could see, <laughs> like, if, if I zoom out a bit, <laughs> it should be visible. Uh, like, you, you can see, let's say, statistics about your modules. Uh, and the dependencies that you are using. So, for example, now when I look at Cobra, I can see that it has this certain download pattern, which means that people are still using it. <laughs> they are downloading it, right? And that's a good thing. So it means that there are, out there are people that depend on it, so probably there are contributors to it. So that should help. Then there's also... Um, the Athens project, which there was a talk about, I think, already, uh, from the creator of Athens, which is a bit more advanced than what I've shown you with the first proxy. So this one actually uh, is focused on building your own uh, proxy server inside the company. It's very powerful, and I encourage you to check it out. Bonus, there's the proxy.golang org, which is default in 1.13, uh, and it allows you to basically like one go 1.13 will go there uh, by default, and this allows you to like have better download speeds and security that the packages you depend on uh, are still there. And I think that's it if we still want to get questions. So I'll leave these slides uh, on screen with resources. Uh, if you want to take a picture now, or um, ping me afterwards at the JetBrains booth, and I'm happy to, to share them. Okay, and the reading resources. So I encourage you to, to read the wiki article on Go modules. There's a lot to cover, which I haven't even touched in, in this talk because modules are pretty complex. The algorithm behind the version selection is a very cool one. Uh, but it's also a very lengthy post. You can find more details about this at the second address on Russ's personal blog. And I highly recommend to, to give it a read. And finally, if you use our tools, uh, go on this address on the blog and you can see how to make it work with the ID. So questions, raise your hand or just ask. If Do we have enough time? I forgot to ask it. Yeah, I think we have. And okay, are there any questions? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Or <laughs> contact me afterwards. You've been quite exhaustive. <laughs> yeah. So let's thank Florin for his talk. Yeah. Thank you.